Mark, <clears throat> I won't ask his age, but I know he has lots of time to go. He went to Brown and then Stanford, a storied uh, university, and then Baskin Palmer, which perennially has been number one or two in ophthalmology for decades. Hundreds of publications, many, many awards, including the Jackson Lecture, which is ophthalmology's most prestigious. And he was um, the H.J. Smead Professor and Chair of Ophthalmology at Stanford for, as he said earlier, nearly 20 years. So really a 40-year, four-decade career of excellence and excelling. Um, when we talked about this the other day, I told Mark I wanted to touch on uh, the theme of startup. Life as startup, career as startup, department as startup, and of course all the startups that he's been involved in. We have about nine minutes left, which is, is far too little. Um, but let's, let's jump into it, Mark. You've been to a, a number of places. You've moved around a lot. It's always seemed to me that change is, is part of the phenotype of the innovator and the creative mind. Talk to us about change in life and in career for those who have made some, contemplating some, perhaps want to make some and become more entrepreneurial or innovative. Well, let me just start by thanking you and everyone here. I, that was, it was the combination of humbling and embarrassing um, uh, to, to, to sit through, and uh, I didn't know whether it would be a roast or a eulogy, and I'm not sure where it, where it fits in that spectrum, but, but, uh, but anyway, you know, as far as change goes, I think, as you say, you know, we, we're all born naked crying, and everything else is startup activities, you know, and you, you, spend, uh, you spend the first 17 or 18 years sort of doing what your parents want you to do, and then you actually get to do what you want to do, and I think a lot of it revolves around what people are looking to do. Do they have a, 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 a first of all, a, a, an endpoint? Because uh, I think it's a good thing to start with the end in mind and work backwards as opposed to the random walk and, uh, and decide what you want to do. And I think um, in that regard, um, you're, uh, you get to make decisions and, and you also are presented with opportunities that aren't the results of decisions but rather of random interactions. And I think it's that combination of planning and also um, serendipity and sort of uh, improvising, if you will, doing things on the fly, combined with you know pretty meticulous planning for some important things, and I think that's the mix, uh, and I think that involves change. You know, everybody, every, you know, people always uh, sort of quote Darwin as a survival of the, you know, for coining the uh, uh, the concept of uh, of uh, well, obviously of evolution and survival of the fittest, but what what Darwin really said was survival of the most adaptable, and so I think that sort of speaks to this issue of change, um, that change is inevitable. Uh, you can either deal with change or you can try to affect change. I, I think what I decided to do was to try to do both, uh, to deal with the change that came my way, and then to, uh, if I could, to uh, affect change for the better. And, 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 and I think we all do that. Uh, we all try to do that. And it's just a question of you know, uh, how, how much it's a conscious effort and how much it's uh, something that just occurs in the course of your lifetime. So just to follow up on that, the fact that you've been at a number of places, all quite storied in and of themselves, we are defined by place and place helps or hinders us. Talk about which of those many places you've been have had the greatest impact and helped push you toward uh, the, the sort of innovator model more than others. How important has it sure. been to A, B, or et cetera? You know, I think we're all the product of our uh, genetics and then our, our life experiences, the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, genes and, and, and environment. Uh, and, and I would say that I, I've really had, um, I guess, five influences in my life, my family. I'm, I come from a long uh, line of physicians. I'm a third generation or fifth generation, depending if you skip one great-grandfather. Great um, and so I, in, in that regard, I, I, I grew up never really uh, not knowing what I was going to do. I knew I was going to be a doctor. I just didn't know if I'd be a urologist or a psychiatrist or a general surgeon. And in that regard, it didn't even seem like a choice. But I did get to choose inside medicine what to do. And so that was a big influence on me. And then I think my, uh, my university life has, has really had and my family, my current family and my, the family that raised me had a big influence. But I'd say I, I spent most of my career in, in two universities at Brown as an undergrad, 
and, um, and at Stanford uh, in my training. And I'd say they both had very important influences in my life. At Brown, I, I think I, I learned how to think, and I learned about things that are worth thinking about, uh, what, what was worth caring about uh, in terms of values and trying to, maybe trying to make a difference in the world, you know, leading a life of, Brown's credo is to lead a life of usefulness and reputation. And then when I got to Stanford, it was a very different world. It was a great university, arguably a greater university in terms of rankings and so forth. But I think at Stanford, I learned about how to do things. Uh, it's just a place where people get stuff done, and it, you're just surrounded by this enormous amount of, uh, uh, of uh, just utter brilliance. And it's not about being the smartest person in the room. It's more about, are you the dumbest person in the room? And, and uh, sometimes you end up managing uh, a lot of smart people, and I found that. So those were two very bar big influences. And in between, I spent time at Baskin Palmer, where I just met the, the greatest ophthalmologist in the world, uh, and, and I met Ed Norton, and he had a big influence on me as the chairman, as the founder of the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. He was a great man, and he had great values. Uh, and I watched him just sort of as he navigated all the changes, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to have that type of Im uh, impact in life to be able to, to train other people that could, you know, carry on a mission? And I had also the good fortune um, uh, to, uh, to go to uh, Royal Oak, Michigan, where I joined Associated Retinal Consultants, and amongst many people, Mike Tracy and, and uh, George Williams had a, a big, Im and Ray Margario and Mort Cox, and they made a big influence on my life. I, I looked at what, what it was to be a really a great clinician and to, and to learn how to operate a, not only a medical practice, but to operate a business and to think about the patient and to also think about how you do things. And so I think those are the, probably the four or five influences that that I think helped me to become the person uh, that I am today. And so, Stanford, uh, you arrive at Stanford, it's a, an amazing university with what I would call a strong, well-regarded uh, department at the time. Uh, you, I think, clearly strengthened it considerably, but more to today, took it in a different direction of innovation and entrepreneurship. There are people who are either in departments or lead departments in the audience who might, or watching, we're streaming this, who might want to do the same. So if you were to give them a couple points of advice, uh, what would you say, how do you move a, a department more toward that model of external innovation, incorporated innovation, et cetera? You know, I, I have strong feelings about this, so I'll share them with you. I'm, I'm not sure they're right, but they're my, they're my view. I think science is only great to the extent, there are many ways to think of science. You can think of science like art as beauty, as elegance, as simplicity as something fundamental, or you can think of science in the service of humanity. And I tend to be an applied person. I always liked applied math better than basic math. I always preferred engineering to physics. And, and I think in that same regard, I think when I thought about what it was to create a department, there were two models. One is to have great science, uh, and then to hope that the patients will come, and then to apply that science to patients, and to, and to use that to build a department. And the other was to build, to build a great uh, clinical department and then to layer science on top of that. And I, and I was very heavily influenced by Ed Norton. Ed Norton went down to Baskin Palmer and there was, no, there was nothing. It was, you know, it was a, it was, the university was brand new and uh, the medical school was brand new and they didn't have a good department and he did that and then he ate, layered on. And I, I'd say in the same way, uh, for those of you that are looking at uh, careers, whether it's in business or whether it's in academia or whether it's in clinical practice, the patient comes first, everything starts with the patient. Uh, what the patient needs, what can you do to make that patient's life better, and then you build around that and you layer on top of that, and all kinds of great things happen. I believe that great medicine begets great science. There are people who believe that great science begets medicine, and it's not that simple. Uh, it's not one or the other, but I would say that if you want to develop the resources to be able to do great science and even great business, if you take care of great patients, if you take care of your patients, whether you're building a company with great products, or drugs or services, uh, and it's directed at the patient, uh, then you've got a better chance for success. And that will trump a lot of other stuff like pure execution, if you will. Um, Ed Norton was an amazing person. I think uh, I probably met him as doing an interview when you were there, and he said two things to me. He asked me two things. He said, do patients come first and are you honest? There were so many questions in my interview. And uh, so Ambassador Palmer was probably the greatest ophthalmic department startup in our, in our era. 
Um, so great. Now you uh, you come to to Stanford, and even before you've been innovating. And as as I counted, looking at your accomplishments, at least heavily involved with twelve startups, founding or co-founding seven, now exited five. That's really an amazing uh, accomplishment first, but it's an equally amazing breadth of experience. And we all know that there are ups and downs in these experiences. Uh, we only have a minute or two, but I want you to share with us at least a story, and you can have license to share too if you wish, but a story that to you highlights um, why you want to do this. What in all those experiences um, have, have you found particularly rewarding, or what were the lessons, or you can use any, pick from any of those experiences to share one with the group. I don't know if there's a single story. I think it's, it's sort of an, a, a larger story of, of actually making the products uh, that are actually used on patients is where the rubber meets the road. I, I wrote a lot of papers. I had a lot of grants over the years, a fair number, you know, and I'd done a lot of science at the bench and, and so forth. And, but I, I, I think early on in my career, I had the sense that I couldn't scale uh, what I was doing. I was taking care of patients one at a time, or if maybe if you wrote a good paper, people would try a technique or something you did. But, but if you built things with your hands, you know, or, or with your mind, um, that had some sort of enduring value, uh, that it, it would really make a difference and that would give you uh, leverage, not financial leverage in the tr traditional sense of the word, but leverage to expand what your scope and reach were. Um, and so I think in doing that, my, I think my academic life and my uh, corporate life, which were both extremely important to me, converged. And, and then I was in the, I think this is always about a team. It's never about a person. I, I take this, these awards with a grain of salt. You know, you just, the way to get these awards is to surround yourself with great people and treat them well. Um, and if you do that, everything just, everything, and you have a, a mission, of course, with those people, everything else takes care of itself. And so I think as a chair, I was always looking for talent. I was always looking for the best residents, always looking for the best faculty, always looking for the best uh, fellows. Um, and I would, and I have something that I, I'll share with you. It's, it's this concept of screening and selection um, and, and, and to get to those people. And I think the screening process is you take it as a, the ante to get to the table is, is talent um, and intellect and, and skills. Um, and that's what you screen for so that everybody you meet and that you interact with has to have those qualities. But then you select for character. And by character, I mean uh, work ethic, and I mean honesty and integrity and, tra and transparency. And um, if you start with a larger pool of very talented people, and there are lots and lots of talented people, they're not, there aren't millions and millions, but there are certainly thousands or tens of thousands, and then you select for those people, and you surround yourself with them, and you provide resources, and you try to provi you know, uh, uh, provide some sense of direction and maybe uh, cultur cultural values, if you will, about taking care of patients and treating people uh, well. Um, uh, that, that is the secret sauce. I mean, that's the formula, and, it, and that bridges whether you're in devices or drugs or running a, a, a clinical department or just running a, a pretty good um, research department or, or practice. Those are the things that I think are important, and I think if, and they're, you know, they're sort of the basic bread and butter fundamentals and no, no magic to it really, but it's, I think it's hard to execute because there are so many pressures on us to succeed, um, you know, and so many financial pressures and so many um, reasons why you might want to cut a corner here or there because it's the easy thing to do. And, um, but I think if you try to stick to, the, stick to those basics, it seems to me that over the long term, maybe not over the short term, but over the long term, it pays off, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a secret for success. Great. Well, Mark, thank you for everything you've given back uh, to medicine, to ophthalmology, and to, to our community. I'll add an adjective to the many you've heard about, Mark, and that is accessible. So if any of you want to continue this discussion or just need advice on any of these things, life, career, job, uh, company, I'm sure Mark will be happy to talk to you. Uh, with that, I'd like you to step this way, if you would. And I'd like to share with you, it's my honor to share with you, this uh, OIS Lifetime Innovator Achievement Award. Mark, thank you.